good evening everyone uh, my name is dr maheshwaran pichimuthu i am a consultant hb ben multi organ transplant surgeon from phd institute of medical sciences in coimbatore so i am going to talk about an interesting case which is kind of quite rare uh, and uh, i am going to go take you through the case scenario the diagnosis investigation that we have uh, done as well as the management that we have performed for the patient after that i am going to briefly discuss about some of the pancreatic fistulas i am going to ask some questions you know whoever is willing to answer please may can give we have a lot of time so we can go through for that also so this is a case history of a 13 years old young girl and uh, she is actually close to somewhere in salem and uh, she presented with abdominal pain which is radiating to the back for 10 days and uh, they have done an investigation outside one of the hospitals in salem and what they have found was she's got pancreatitis with gallstones she was very sick to an extent that she was tachycardic and uh, she required a lot of fluids and it's kind of peripheral center so they thought of keeping her in the icu so admitted in the icu and uh, on examination she had tenderness in the epigastric region she was treated conservatively she had a minimal clinical improvement and then uh, what they said is like this is going to be a complicated pancreatitis so then the patient needs to go to higher center for further referral and one more thing if you have any questions in between feel free to stop me so this is the ct scan which was done outside and uh, you can appreciate that uh, the patient has got uh, multi localized cystic areas inside the abdomen and uh, because her history of pancreatitis with gallstones we consider this as a pancreatic pseudocyst so what do we have to do next shall i proceed sir or uh, shall i wait for question hello ah uh, yes there's anybody who's going to answer please hey yeah, just wait for a while otherwise you can because i think okay most, sir okay sir. most of the senior level and uh, i don't know how many students there sure sir so this is a ct i presume there is no questions i'm going to proceed to the next slide and uh, this patient was treated conservatively in our hospital also her symptoms kind of majority the majority of the symptoms is gone and uh, the patient actually he came to go home and the patient was discharged uh, with the uh, uh, with the prediction that this pseudocyst will resolve on its own so she had a second admission overnight just came for some cough but clinically she was completely fine she was discharged then again after few days she got admitted again with abdominal pain and vomiting this time she also had shortness of breath so we did a repeat ct scan in our hospital and you can see i have put some cut sections of the ct and the pseudocyst that was there in the abdomen completely or near near completely resolved and uh, can anyone see any fluid collection in the abdomen which is kind of tracking somewhere if anyone wants to comment please unmute and comment okay sir so we can't hear you sir i said there is a collection just above the liver which uh, just above the liver which is tracking down yes sir yes sir you're absolutely right there is a collection which is sitting i can show you i'm moving my cursor and you can see there is a collection here and you can see a small track which is actually we don't know where it starts where it ends and also here you can see a track here and there is little bit of fluid collection and beyond that we cannot see anything and again we did a chest x ray this is a chest x ray so what we can see here is uh, the whole right side is completely white out and uh, that's why the patient admitted this time with a shortness of breath and her abdominal symptoms are completely gone that she doesn't have any abdominal pain and uh, she doesn't have any you know gi like symptoms like diarrhea you know or uh, 
um, any loose you know like a bad like stools or is she having any you know fever no jaundice nothing there is nothing at all the only thing she had predominant symptom that she got on the third admission was shortness of breath and the ct scan showed the pseudo cyst kind of near normally resolved and the patient has got this collection in the chest so the commonest thing that we always think about pancreatitis and the patient with the present with pleural effusion is you know this the the pancreatitis can produce what's called sympathetic effusion and that can present but majority of the time usually it's on the left side rather than on the right side and uh, if you look at the incidence of pleural effusion in uh, pancreatitis is almost like uh, 15 to 30% but um, the pancreatitis due to uh, the pancreatic the pleural effusion related with the pancreatic rich amylases kind of 1% among all pleural effusions so what do we do on this patient next there is a pleural effusion on the right side patient present with shortness of breath and the abdomen showed near near normal or near completely resolved uh, pseudocyst do a Any comment? diagnostic and therapeutic aspiration and submit it for amylase examination excellent that's what we have to do sir but what happened this patient i don't have the x-ray of the uh, next one the next day morning the patient is completely fine and uh, we did an x-ray the pleural effusion kind we the pay initially the who the resident who has seen the patient in the uh, emergency department thought it is related to pancreatitis they thought we can give some diuretics and see whether this result they gave some diuretics the pleural effusion started getting better so light pleural treated conservatively the pleural effusion was dissolving and the patient got discharged after four days even this time the I amyl mean, the pleural fluid was not tapped so she present again after 10 days with recurrent abdominal pain this time cough vomiting and again the chest x-ray showed again massive right pleural effusion she was admitted in the pediatric icu in our hospital and uh, as i told you before third admission with abdominal pain vomiting chest x-ray and ct showed right pleural effusion so this time we were so concerned and uh, we thought it's a pancreatic or pleural fistula and we put a actually rather than uh, aspirating we put a chest drain so that we can drain all the fluid and we send the fluid for amylase and the amylase, amylase level as expected was quite high so what we thought was there are few options that we do have so initially we they thought we can put a chest drain put the patient noctritide and uh, put an NJ tube to feed her so that we can give the rest to the proximal gut and also what we did is we did an uh, ERCP what we found was there is a disruption of the duct but there is a collection in the between the body and the tail and uh, we did a sphincterotomy we did a stent placement again we did repeat ct scan after the ERCP and we cannot even see any pseudocyst in the abdomen is the case clear sir but do you have an image ERCP I'll, I'll show you because the image that is an interesting one. I'm going to show you in okay, a minute. Okay, okay, fine, fine. Um, so what we did, what happened was this patient was in ICU after all these treatment like a thoraco uh, chest drain and octreotide and uh, NJ feeding. The patient did not improve at all. Patient started have recurrent fever, recurrent shortness of breath, and we can see we keep repeating the chest X-ray for you know alternate days or once in three days or something like that, and there is some. Um, haziness in the right lower zone. So we repeated the CT, and what we found was uh, patient had kind of consolidation fluid collection in the right lower lung. So we thought, you know, closer to the lower lung, and we thought it's a right side empyema. Patient is spiking fever, and the drain was a little bit turbid. So we thought it's is that a right empyema. So the plan was to go ahead with the thoracoscopy and decortication, which she had, but. The child did not improve at all on the respiratory point of view. And uh, when we repeated the scan, we thought she developed some cavitating lesion in the right lower lung. So I'll, I'll, I'll tell you the sequel. Eh? So she was taken to theater by the cardiothoracic team. And I got involved at that point. Until then, I was not involved. I was treated by the uh, general and pediatric team. So 
when they called me to the operating room what they told me is they found the lower uh, lobe of the right lung is kind of completely digested like like a mushy lung and they said it is not going to you know resolve so they did a right lower lobectomy and when they looked when they took the right lower lobe what they found is there is a small hole in the diaphragm and they can put a forceps inside and it's kind of well defined epithelialized tract and this is the picture of that the right lower lung has been taken and you can see the forceps where there is a tract which is kind of completely epithelialized so what we thought was this is kind of fistless tract which is going downwards into the abdomen most probably it could be a pancreas connection but what do we do at this time so whether it was the fistula or have any other option dr cutter any comments from the audience what is that sorry then no, no, i am just waiting for dr cutter yeah. so yeah it's a very tough situation now with the hole leading to the pancreatic uh, pancreatitis area even if you suture it it will break down again i think so unless you ablate that epithelialized tract this is going to persist yes sir so what options do we have at this point patient is on table and the tract has been opened and there is a hole in the diaphragm Yeah, actually, uh, my children, like you put a T tube. I don't know if it's possible to pass an infant feeding tube uh, retrograde into the duodenum. If possible, if there is any. Excellent, sir. Excellent, sir. That's what I did. I put the information in the previous one. Infant feeding tube was placed to the tract, and what we thought was we can continuously drain outside, like a chest tube. That's what we did. But what I did was after the the infant feeding tube was placed. and uh, when the patient is in the recovery we injected dye into the uh, feeding tube to see what is the anatomy in the abdomen because it is communicating with something below so you can see the left side there is a diagram i think you can appreciate there is a tract it's like a plus sign there is a right. tract and there is a criss cross tract crossing then what we have seen and i think most of you can appreciate there is a dye in the duodenum so this is a proximal pancreatic duct and there is a area like a junction from there there are three tracts going on and this is the tract which is going towards the thorax in which there is infant feeding tube has been placed and the dye has been injected and there is a tract going towards the splenic area where you can see lot of you know side branches so that is like a distal pancreatic duct and there is another tract which is going from the junction towards the spleen towards the left side so then we we took at the re review on all the cts and all the images that been done so what happened was when we attempted an ercp and the stent thing the stent gone into the proximal duct and there is a disruption rather than the stent going to the distal duct it actually gone through the disruption and just come out of the duct into the into the, in the, in the from the pancreas So it crosses. It causes a small false track also. Right. So this is situation that we do have, and what we have to. So there is a stent in C two already. Stent is in C two. Yeah, I mean I don't know. But you, uh, either you can exchange and put a stent, uh, another stent, but but the, you see it's very difficult to go into the distal limb. See, it is so angulated. All that you can do is you can uh, stent the the proximal duct, or you can just pull out the previous stent a little bit. Okay. Making sure that the tip uh, doesn't go into the false thing and it's only stop short of it. Okay. So as I, as I mentioned, yes, it showed well developed pancreatic or pleural tract, false tract through the duct disruption, proximal and distal pancreatic ducts also uh, seen. So what we did is this. Um, we always try to go for you know uh, first try endoscopic method whether to see whether that can help us to solve the issue so we re attempt an erc we pull the stent and we put oh my god um, so we pull the stent we try to put the guide wire i mean obviously the uh, medical gastroenterologist put the guide wire it was there inside the operating room it was done in the operating room 
we thread the guide wire into the digital pancreatic duct and it actually gone into the digital pancreatic duct initially few attempts it preferably want to go through the the defect in the duct and goes towards the false flag then we readjusted the guide wire and try to put it through the digital duct it's gone into the digital duct couple of times but when we try to feed the catheter through that so that we can place the stent it keeps slipping because when the moment the tip of the catheter goes into the duct disruption the whole guide wire pushes through the defect so it's not engaging into the distal duct so this is a situation and the patient almost like the patient was in the hospital for almost like 5 to 6 weeks by the time and we have done all these things and the child is still not resolving i mean obviously the lung point of view the chest drain is there and then there is a separate drain infant feeding tube that is draining through the tract and then we attempted erct that also failed so this is a situation we were at this point what is the next option that we do have here in the uh, in spite of the fact that uh, this ch child had a thoracotomy already you know you see the and uh, the multiple attempts to do endoscopic treatment doesn't seem to help there's a only final solution is because again the sizable head and uh, body of the pancreas is still available so we have to go in although it's going to be difficult but it go and uh, do a distal pancreas Yes, sir. That's what we have decided. So this is the next question. Continue with the conservative treatment or proceed. And sir, and Dr. Rakesh Kattar ji, will have any different idea? No, no, no. I, I, I agree with you. It is a very tough situation when the conservative uh, stenting uh, has also the stenting has also failed and the drain in the chest is also draining and the drain in the fistula is also draining and she is already there for five six weeks. There is no option but to operate. and what operation is to be done uh, uh, is to be i think decided on the table yes sir so before uh, we decided about surgery we explored some other option i just want the opinion from the audience is there any experience of injecting glue into it through the tract we have infant feeding tube sitting in the pancreatic obturator fistula can we inject the glue I don't know. I haven't heard of a glue injection into a pancreatic fistula, but of course, anything can be innovative. I mean, there's no harm in trying since surgery is the option we we have as the last option. But then that that uh, glue shouldn't. Uh, uh, we can't control the glue as to to what extent it can go. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That is the main problem. So, see, obviously, this patient. I know this patient requires surgical treatment, but she's a child, 13 years old, young, and I I tried to already had a thoracotomy. so we were thinking is there any way that we can you know sort this child without putting it through another major surgery so we were exploring all these options so exactly that question was raised uh, whether we can inject the glue exactly the answer was we cannot control how far we can inject the glue if we inject the glue into the tract if it goes to the pancreatic duct if it solidifies what happened to the pancreas that will be a major issue yeah that's a major problem so we decided to go ahead with the surgery and uh, we discussed with the pay, uh, family very you know quite lengthily especially because it's only 13 if we do a distal pancreatic there is a risk of diabetes and we explained to the patient uh, explained to the family and again they said it's because they you know spent almost 6 weeks with the uh, illness to pose with multiple ma management options so they said go ahead and do the surgery so she had a spleen preserving distal pancreatectomy and cholecystectomy and a feeding gingostomy you can see here on this picture i don't know you can appreciate i can put my cursor over there the splenic artery actually got involved into the the collection area where the pancreas is like a, there is a fistulous tract from the chest and the false tract as well as the distal pancreas tract and the proximal duct all join that area was actually that the splenic artery is actually going very close it's very adherent to the uh, area so we ended up in ligating the splenic artery but we preserved the splenic vein and uh, we left the short gastric intact so the spleen got the blood supply through the short gastric and drain through the splenic vein the spleen did not change its color from before and after ligating the uh, splenic artery so post operatively we actually kept the drain in the chest with the infant feeding tube which completely dried she spent another 2 days in the intensive care unit 
third day she was transferred to the ward chest pain is more tolerant to oral diet and the pancreatin actually we put a drain in the abdomen to make sure like uh, uh, we are not having any pancreatic fistula through that uh, but uh, the drain accidentally pulled by the child and the drain fell up by day 5 and she was doing completely fine because they are coming from a long distance from a small village they want to stay in the hospital for another few days eventually the, the child got discharged after 10 days of the operation and the patient was seen in the post op clinic three times and her uh, sugars are maintaining well she is not becoming a diabetic maybe we have to wait for another year to see whether uh, is there an impact from the distal pancreatectomy she is doing well and gaining weight this is the story of the patient so i would like uh, to measure if i can interrupt um yes, actually did you go with the plan that you want to preserve spleen because in this yes, cases is not easy second thing is how did you manage the stump and how did the manager duct because manage the post operative pancreatic duct leaks can up to 40% whatever way you try yes sir so this patient you know i again explained to the family there is a possibility we are going to take the spleen out but this is a young child so i want to preserve this spleen if it is possible i am not going with the plan of definitely to preserve this spleen if it needs to come out it needs to come out there is no second uh, thought about that so when i dissected i i was very careful when i went close to the spleenic vein because i i want to preserve that if possible the spleenic vein was actually away from the the pancreatic inflamed area so it was completely preserved but i cut the hepatic art sorry the spleenic artery i put a suture and i felt it it's a pulsating one i know it's spleenic artery but beyond that i'm not able to get good pulsation and after that some time i can get the pulsation but without ligating the spleenic artery i'm not able to take the distal pancreas out so i ended up in ligating but i thoroughly checked the short gastric couple of times and they had a very good pulsation so i left it like that so i was not planning to go with definitely to preserve this thing but i i had the option if possible to preserve this thing if not to take the uh, spleen out in this case uh, luckily we didn't have we didn't damage the splenic vein but we damage the spleen i mean like we like the splenic artery but we know the splenic artery uh, splenic spleen has got dual blood supply so we just you know uh, we wait for probably about 20 30 minutes to see is there any change in color of the spleen is there about it most of the time the spleen gets very good blood supply from the short gastric like a washer technique where we even ligate both the splenic artery as well as the splenic vein still the spleen survives here we have ligated only one uh, vessel so i was a bit more bold enough to just leave the spleen regarding the question about the fistula i went just beyond where there is the inflamed area where i suspected the the fistulous tracts are i felt the fistulous tract when i went inside from the uh, diaphragm so i was feeling the tract i actually hooked around the tract i cut the tract proximally and ligated it and the distal tract i just followed it up so i know exactly where it is coming from so i cut the pancreas in a little bit healthy area you can actually in this picture you can see this is the cut end of the pancreas i put a two prole in i closed it with omental reinforcement when i put the drain in i told the drain fell off by day 5 we check the drain amylase uh, my protocol is day 1 day 3 if it is low i actually i pull the drain out so first time when we uh, measured the drain amylase it was around 600 or 700 it is still on the higher side so we didn't remove the drain but day 3 the drain amylase started coming down in this patient because he had multiple previous you know issues and uh, multiple uh, medical management so i thought of beyond the cause he said to keep the drain for another day or two but on day 5 it automatically fell off so i didn't even i because the drain amylase levels are coming down i was comfortable enough to leave it leave her alone rather than thinking about doing a scan or putting another drain so she did very well after that uh, one, one other comment here because if uh, is is a possibility if uh, the the uh, fistulous tract into the chest can be dissected out completely in in form of projection a, a fistula jejunostomy is a possibility yes sir i was think i was i had that option in my mind before i went inside um i the only problem is the track it's kind of hardly maybe maybe 4 or 5 mm that's the only diameter they may have even less than that so suturing a jejunum into the you had to open lay open the whole track and suturing the jejunum and what happens is if that fails what is the next option we do have if i just do a fistula jejunostomy there are it's a, it's it's in the literature that you can do enteropancreatic anastomosis but if that fails 
what other options we do have this patient the it's like a, in india obviously you know we have a cost so when the patient come for surgery they want a definitive management they don't want to they don't have money to spend for another surgery they are a kind of very poor background so we need to make a one shot that should be a right shot so we we discussed that option also i went into that's why i dissect the business back to see whether i can do the anesthesia my next the question will be two small and five rows okay i agree next question will be what what does happen to the gallbladder is gallstones a cause for it we removed sir we we did a colostectomy okay my, my, Rakesh, my, yes my question is uh, retrospectively uh, do you think that thoracotomy could have been avoided and a lobectomy could have been avoided absolutely sir absolutely because there are literature there are so many literature says you know patients with the pancreatic uh, pleural fistula what happens is because this amylase which is coming directly from the pancreas without touching the gut they don't have any digestive property to digest all the proteins what it has got it has got an what's called uh, a pressure effect or what you can call it as like some fluid you know seepage into the lung which can cause the lung a little bit more softer and in young pediatric patients we always expect the lung is quite soft but i was not there at the time the lower lobe was taken and after the lobe was taken they showed me that looks very ugly anyway but if we know you know in advent we have done this uh, distal pancreatomy we solved the pancreatic pleural fistula thoracotomy would have been avoided na uh, uh, dr kataji the fact is we have had uh, quite a few adult uh, pancreatic pleural fistula where chest was never except for a chest tube chest was never opened or the thoracic surgeon never operated on the pancreatic uh, yes. i think he was consulted late in the process had yeah, it been yeah. earlier mm. So absolutely correct, sir. Because well, I mean, as I went through some little amount of the literature, usually you don't need to do the any anything to do with the chest. So shall I move to the next slide, sir? Yes, sure, yes, sure, please. So I've got any, some. Any any other comments from the audience? From anybody else want to just come up and say something? Yeah. Okay. My issue can carry. Okay. So I want to give just brief idea about what is pancreatic fistula. So if any of the PGs are there. if they want to you know answer please go ahead so first question is what is pancreatic fistula so it's an abnormal communication between the pancreas and any other organ why it's happening because either it's because of the disruption of the duct or there is a pseudo cyst which is growing in size which may have a communication or with the which may have communication whether it's a big communication or small communication but the pseudo cyst ruptures into other organs and forms a fistula cyst how do we classify pancreatic fistulas so we can classify the pancreatic fistulas according to the site whether it is external fistula or internal fistula external fistula the pancreatic fistula has a communication with the skin internal fistula it can have communication with any of the internal organs uh, not only pleura any of the internal organs also we can we can classify the pancreatic fistula according to the uh, drainage amount if it is more than 200 ml high output fistula it is less than 200 ml it's called low output fistula i mention here because we have like ec fistula intracutaneous fistula where the amount of fluid to classify how to low output is like 500 then we can also classify the pancreatic fistula according to the disease cause whether it is acute or chronic pancreatitis or it is due to malignancy or there is normal pancreas there in which there is a fistulous tract is developing and any immediate predisposing factors like surgery or any percutaneous intervention has been done or any trauma happened so how do we grade pancreatic fistula i have extrapolated from the uh, isgpf like a international study group for pancreatic fistula uh, they have given this grading mainly for the post operative pancreatic fistula so grade a is a biochemical leak where the patient doesn't have any symptoms or you need to do any alteration in the clinical management grade b is there is high amylase in the brain and you have to do some sort of clinical management change for example you have to put them a patient on tpn or you have to change antibiotic or higher antibiotics or you have to give outfit right or some other intervention you do but you can do radiological intervention as well but no operative intervention this is grade b and if you do any operative intervention or if the patient develops any organ failure or death it considers a 
trade secret. What is the sequel of pancreatic fistula? Once it starts, what, what happens? If it is external fistula, it started excoriating the skin and patient usually be malnourished and they develop acidosis. Sometimes through the tract, they can get infection of the pancreatic collection. And if it is an internal fistula, it can have communication through the peritoneal cavity, forms in pancreatic acidities. Again, this can cause malnutrition and infection or it can go to thoracopancreatic fistula. In thorax, they can have a communication with the pleura, they can have a communication with the bronchus, they can have a communication with the mediastinum or pericardium. In some cases, what happens is the duct completely get disrupted and it can form what's called a disconnected pancreatic duct syndrome. So the clinical features and investigations for the pancreatic fistula is quite vague because as I told you in our patient, patient even though the primary pathology is in the pancreas, the symptoms are from the chest. So similar to that, if, if it goes into the bronchus, patient will present only with cough. They don't have any abdominal symptoms. So symptoms can be very vague. And diagnosis with amylase rich fluid in any of the collection is the diagnostic test. And we can have a lot of imaging options like CT, MRI, ER, CP, and crystallogram. If you look at the CT specificity, it's almost like a, a 50 to 60 percent. MR and ERCP, their sensitivity and specific in the range around 75 to uh, 80, 85 percent. Uh, and we can also do a fistulogram, but what it does is it, it says where the fistula is coming from. Uh, other than that, we cannot give any uh, information. There is a difference between MRCP and ERCP. The ERCP we can also use as a therapeutic uh, tool, where if there is a disrupted uh, strictures duct, we can stent the duct so that we can completely solve the problem. But one pitfall with the ERCP is if there is a complete narrowing of the pancreatic or disrupted pancreatic duct, you may not be able to see what is anatomy beyond the disruption or the structure. But MRCP will help us to delineate what is the anatomy beyond that area, but it is not a therapeutic tool. So pancreatic pleural fistula is a very infrequent company, uh, complication of acute or chronic pancreatitis, usually less than 1%. And uh, there is a, there are studies says like among the pleural effusion it is one percent among the patient in the pancreatitis the rate of pancreatic pleural fistula developing is only 0 0.04 percent most of the time it, it comes in a chronic pancreatitis related to alcohol and uh, as I discussed earlier the management options are quite diverse uh, they say the conservative option endoscopic option and surgical option in our patient if the patient has got normal duct anatomy or minimal dilatation and the leakage is minimal what you would have done is you would have put a thoracostomy like a chest tube and we should have put the patient on uh, operated sometimes this conservative management will help previously people used to put the patient on npo as well as epn but what happened was sometimes if you do a, a complete nil by mouth uh, patient will go for uh, the intestinal mucosal atrophy and translocation of you know uh, bacteria and causes infection and sometimes the patient succumbs to infection. That's why the, the latest uh, conservative appro approaches doesn't recommend uh, NPO. What they say is either you can give an NJP or you can treat the patient normally. The second option, which is the most widely used option is endoscopic option. You can have an endoscopic ultrasound scan, you can have an ERCP, or you can have a combination of both. Sometimes you can, what we do in the bile that like a rendezvous procedure, we can also do a rendezvous procedure through endoscopic ERCP approach where you can place the guide wire in the distal duct through the endoscopic ultrasound scan. Also place the guide wire through the uh, uh, proximal pancreatic duct and then via ERCP you can go and you know feed the uh, pull the guide wire through the pancreas and feed the stent. That is one option we can do it or if it is a simple case we can try for a ERCP directly and uh, bridge the defect so that the tract completely heals. What happens if we do an ERCP with the stenting? We have to keep monitoring the patient approximately at least minimum every six months because if we, leave, we cannot leave the stent in situ forever and we have to make sure the tract is forming. Then we have to remove the uh, stent and put a new stent. And last resort is a surgical option. Um, what the indication for uh, surgical option is like if there is a complete duct disruption or distal pancreas is involved or multiple conservative as well as other medical management phase, then surgical options come.
So the efficacy of the conservative management is only 30 to 60 percent. One series, it's less than that. And even if you do conservative management, the recurrence rate is about 15 percent and mortality is around 12 percent. The conservative, it includes only medical management as well as endoscopic management. We can maximum use it for two to four weeks. So endoscopic approach of the synchronous and stenting will help, but the success rate is only 25 percent. Surgical management involves either you can do a drainage procedure like endopancreatic drainage or you have to do a resection. The success rate with surgery is 90%, but still there are possibilities this can also recur. For example, if you do an endopancreatic diversion, that if the duct is still disrupted and started, you know, causing stricture in the distal pancreas, patient may develop recurrent pancreatitis and recurrent pseudocyst collection. Thank you for your patient audience. I'm happy to take any questions now. I, I, I saw Kanan in the audience. Kanan, you can come up with your experience. I joined in the middle. So oh, okay, like that. The duck got injured in the middle only. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. See, anything in the pancreatic injury, anything proximal, surgeon is in a fix. But anything in the distal injury, we can always give a better result. So as a said, the distal pancreatectomy will be the ideal treatment for this patient. And uh, uh, except the chronic pancreatitis, other things, uh, we need not worry about the fistula. The fistula will uh, heal automatically. Whenever okay. I do a distal pancreatitis for a chronic pancreatitis, I always do a you know, jejunal anastomosis. It's very yeah. safe. Like enteropancreatic drainage, sir? Yeah, yeah. Okay. The other conditions, you know, trauma or any other thing, uh, the fistula will not be a problem because even if it doesn't heal, you can put a stent, it will be all right. But chronic pancreatitis, it is safer to do a, a pancreatic anastomosis. You know? Yes, sir. Like the dual procedure. Uh, like that, something like that. Yeah. Uh, Govind Purushottaman, what is your query? Govind? Sir, yes, ask the question on the chat box. What is it? Yeah, go yes. Sir. Hello, sir. Yes, sir. Good evening, sir. This is Govind from Stanley Medical College, sir. Yes, sir, uh, did we uh, do an MRCP for this patient, sir, initially when uh, this was detected? So, what happened was uh, this patient did not have an MRCP because the patient was claustrophobic. He's not able to okay. lie on the table. So, we are a little okay, bit, sir. you know, uh, handicapped on yes, that. But we did yes, everything, sir. whatever we can do. Sir, no, but sir. My question is actually. My, sir, I, my question is actually, uh, sir, actually, if we do an MRCP, uh, could an MRCP predict, like uh, we went ahead and did an ERCP first of all for this patient. Now, could an MRCP have uh, uh, decided on whether to go ahead with the surgery in the first place or to try with ERCP? Is it uh, necessary that we go through ERCP every time? Uh, or in some cases, are we selected to, uh, are we allowed to uh, go ahead with surgery in the first place, like the first option itself? So can yes. MRCP predict the management, uh, uh, surgical management, more probable surgical management in a certain set of patients? Is there any criteria uh, by the MRCP uh, where which we can say that this patient is to go for surgery, he will not settle with ERCP and stenting, sir? Okay. I, you know, I completely agree with you. MRCP is going to be quite useful in this situation. If the MRCP has been done and the ductal anatomy is clear, the duct is not dilated and there is no stricture, there is a small defect which is communicating, then what we can do is we can sit tight with the conservative management alone. We don't need to even do anything yes. because most of the time it yes. settles. And yes. if that doesn't settle, still we know the roadmap. We know where the ducts are, where it's going and all those things. So we can assess the size of the defect and we can also have a planned idea of whether ERCP would help, help or not. Yes, sir. So, uh, so, so actually in our clinical practice, uh, we are supposed to take an MRCP as the first thing. Right, sir? That's correct. That's correct. We have to do. But you oh. know, sometimes patients, all patients may not yes. be able to have MRCP, you know, especially yes, this sir. Yes, sir. Got it. We were, Got it, sir. Yeah, I just asked. So. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I was just asking the roadmap, sir. That, that's yeah, it. definitely. I mean, oh, I, as I explained, MRCP will give a clear-cut roadmap. Even there is a structure or disruption where ERCP may not be able to find the anatomy. You can get an no. MRCP that gives clear idea of where the ducts are. So we can plan things very nicely. 
answer uh, as i asked uh, is there yeah. any criteria by which uh, we can go ahead with surgery uh, like i asked uh, every patient has to uh, go through this ercp or uh, like can we directly go to surgery based on the mrcp is there any criteria which uh, being at the mrcp which you would suggest yes. that this patient is to go so, for surgery complete disruption of the duct or yes, there is a stricture proximal to the fistula or okay, the sir. fistulous tract involving the distal pancreas or okay. uh, the, 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 the stricture is there in the pancreas duct that it's, it's distal which we may not be able to do the scanning or we have a medical okay. management as well as endoscopic management fails then we have to go for surgery these are all the indication for surgery we have to take into those consideration okay. but as you asked yeah. right if we know there is a stricture proximal to the fistula on the pancreatic duct then whatever you do it's going to recur yes, especially sir. the yes, complete sir. disruption it's very difficult to do the stenting we know that if there yes. is a stricture in the distal pancreas and the fistula tract is beyond that then we know okay. ercp is going to be very challenging in that case we may take a you know decision of let's go for primary surgery there are uh, literature uh, says that primary surgery is not a bad option and actually in fact it hastens the recovery and it uh, you know re- avoids you know prolonged hospital stay but only problem is we need to yeah. know is whenever we put, contemplate for surgical treatment we need to be you know ready to face the consequences of it for example young child distal pancreatectomy becoming a diabetic it's going to be a disaster and the patient has to have lifelong treatment for that so we have to weigh the benefits yeah. and risks of it the mahesh oh, again okay. thank you sir thank you sir in been very good uh, uh, hands endoscopic hands uh, you know with uh, the very pliable catheters is always possible to go into the distal duct and uh, stent it across i mean uh, um, uh, the place where i was working uh, such things have been done because it's not a it's not a big cavity as you see the, this particular duct doesn't open into cavity but just bit a bit of a maneuver it still can go into the distal duct and you can bridge the gap with us and that is possible actually in good centers that's that's still possible yes sir yes sir i agree with you especially for this child if you want to do that but unfortunately what happens is the guide wire is so you know pliable no it's like a uh, um, so soft so i actually was there in the operating room i actually pushed the guide wire into the distal duct but when when we feed the catheter on top of the guide wire when the catheter tip reaches the defect because a huge cavity the defect is disrupted the guide wire keeps coming off yeah uh, general ravi shankar is watching i just want to know from him whether he operated any chest due to pancreatic uh, fluid pancreatic fistula Did, have i ever done anything of that sort sir if you, if you can unmute you, yourself can you please unmute sir uh, yeah this is uh, we I, i don't have personal experience but we've been often called for a bilateral or a unilateral pleural effusion which might occur because of the uh, transmigration retroperitoneally into the pleural space but honestly i mean i joined a little late but i heard lobectomy was done in this case so i was a little concerned why it was done yeah i mean that's what we want because uh, we understand that in pancreas related problems uh, 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 chest surgery is not generally required yeah they'll settle down with their chest brain can i add one more information on this patient yeah, what happened nice. was um during after the first uh, chest brain second time when they did the thoracoscopic decortication they put a drain and the drain amylase come back as completely normal we don't know why i just asked my colleagues you know that should be the lab error why the amylase is suddenly normal but they checked again it was normal but i'm not sure why the chest brain was like is it because immediately after the surgery they given a good wash or something like that all the wash fluid is coming the amylase level was normal i'm not sure at the time they were thinking the pancreatic pleural fistula is settled then only you know uh, the next uh, thing started and uh, they thought it's an empyema it's a separate complication that's the reason they took the patient to operating room otherwise if you if, if you know this all these things ahead we would not have done the uh, uh, thoracic surgery for this child right um govind prashadman has one more question he said why did he not do the pancreatic surgery on the same sitting when the patient thorax is open that is very difficult 
Reason one is the, the family doesn't know that what we are doing. Their patient family has been counseled very well for thoracic surgery for the lung. If we go and tell them suddenly we are going to do an abdominal operation also, they may get really panicked. Second thing, we didn't know the roadmap at the time. We got the roadmap only after we put the infant feeding tube and inject some dye. We know the tracks very clearly. Then we made a plan of going for a surgical management. So that is the two reason why we did not do the pancreatic surgery in the same sense. So I agree. Yeah, I think that's a better option than opening the abdomen and doing an extra procedure unprepared. I think even the thoracic surgeons must not have seen this entity earlier because it is a very rare entity and it cross it never must not have crossed their mind that such an entity can cause uh, thoracic problems. So th they went ahead and did a thoracotomy and lobectomy. So retrospective. Sir, go on, sir. So I think the thoracic surgeon must not be knowing about this entity. No, the problem is, sir, a pancreatic pleural fistula, if you look at the literature, majority of the time it comes only on the left side. And they said almost like 80% on the left side. And it's almost like a 10% on the right side. And 10% bilaterally. So whenever there is a pancreatitis, if the patient has got right pleural effusion, they have, I don't know whether that is maybe the reason they might have a little bit of lower suspicion about pancreatic pleural fistula. I'm not sure. But that is the literature. And the group that is dealing with the patient is a general surgeons, a pediatric surgeons, pediatric. Or Pediatric surgeon. So, you know, they would have also expected that it's very uncommon in the pediatric age group who have a pseudocyst to the That's also correct. The chest. Most of the time, pancreatic fluid fistula comes in an adult age and usually secondary to chronic alcohol related pancreatitis. And possibly that's where uh, it got misdirected. Karan, any, any other comment from you before? I had a similar patient, but of course not the pleural fistula. Patient had a ductal injury, ductal disruption, and localized collection. This patient, interesting, we did an endo-ultrasound, we put a, through the stomach wall, we put a catheter into the collection and into the pancreatic duct, and then we drained it. Patient, you know, this is how we manage this patient. And that's settled? Yeah. Sometimes we can just do an endoscopic ultrasound guided naso pancreatic drain and then you can drain all the collection in that area where there is a duct disruption. So it won't leak anywhere else. And uh, sometimes it resolves by itself. That's what uh, some of my colleagues said, but uh, I never had personal experience with the naso uh, pancreatic uh, drainage for the uh, pancreatic fistulas. And again, whenever there's a pancreatic pleural fistula and we have a chest drain, and when we settle the pancreatic pathology, the chest cell becomes absolutely clear. It will not leave any sequelae. Correct, sir. Correct. It will settle by itself. Yeah, there, there will not be any pathology like what is seen in this child. Of chronic pancreatitis, you know, chronic pancreatitis uh, developing uh, pancreatic pleural fistula. A few cases we have done, we have done uh, missile pancreatic. Did you do uh, uh, enter pancreatic anastomosis, sir? Yeah, yeah. I told you, you know, in these patients say what we do, we try to lay open the drug, uh, duct. It's, you know, it's a uh, chronic pancreatitis. Yes, sir. So we combine uh, pancreatic jejunostomy. Entire drug to be open and they do a distal pancreatectomy. Almost like uh, uh, even we have combined phrase also. So you, yeah. do you open the whole duct, including the fistulous tract? Yeah, yeah, we do a distal pancreatectomy. See, it's very difficult to point out the fistulous place. You know, all okay. the, theoretically we can say this is a site, but on table it is very difficult to identify. So you did distal pancreatectomy and pancreatic jejunostomy. Yes. Okay. Yeah, actually, actually, Mahesh, uh, it, it, uh, oftentimes when a duct can't be made out uh, from the anterior surface, that is the best way to do. Go transect the tail and find the hole there and then follow it up. That's one. I mean, I've done it quite a few times. As a matter of fact, that will become a dual come uh, use source. But uh, one of the ways of identifying the duct is to transect the this most duct, and you can see it. Because many a times we will not be able to make out the duct from the anterior surface, especially small duct pieces. Yeah, I had once. I have once. In this, I had this experience. Like, uh, I, there is a different patient where there is a stricture in the tail of the uh, pancreas. The previous completely disrupted duct in the middle, uh, formed a pancreatic necrosis, and then uh, had a pseudocyst, cystogastrostomy done. 
after that the sister gas has been completely closed the patient had a recurrence and there is a scripture in the distal pancreas so i i was planning to go for sister jejunostomy to open the whole duct including the cyst but i struggled even after cutting the pancreas i am not able to see the duct where it is so i ended up doing a distal pancreas on that patient also but uh, that's that's a very good option that we can do in case if the ducts are little bit dilated we can see it through the cut surface but well, dr karuna you want to make a comment or ask a question to the karuna so i just had a doubt regarding the splenic artery is there any chance for reconstruction on table like because since that is a predominant uh, blood supply for the spleen like the newer trends and uh, recent advances on table since it's already an infective case on table we can't go ahead but could there be any um, alternative for uh, vascular reconstruction in that particular setting if we come across um good question uh, mauthi actually um okay. what I, i my experience you know uh, even from you can hear is like when um, when we have to divide the splenic artery and splenic vein we never hesitate the reason being and we have seen multiple occasions the short casting alone provides enough blood supply to the spleen and the spleen will survive and it does all its immune function so usually we don't attempt to revascularize the spleen because more surgery you do more morbidity you cause if for example if we do a reconstruction that becomes thrombus or leak or something happens that bleeds then it's an additional morbidity for the patient so we try to reduce the morbidity uh, by doing minimal you know uh, if we have to do we have to do but splenic uh, artery even after ligation Uh, it survives with the short gastric so i never heard about splenic revascularization being done you know in my career any anybody, anybody else thank can throw some ideas sir thank you sir i i haven't heard of uh, because i think spleen is one organ we we'll just throw it away if it comes on away we don't, don't really bother but again i wouldn't have uh, uh, ligated splenic artery left the spleen in situ because this is a girl we i don't want any morbidity whatsoever if uh, a week later she has severe pain and there is a uh, a uh, splenic necrosis or infarct that going to be a, i would have taken it off again with the fear of uh, overwhelming postmenopausal infection is not so very high in in, in india and it is only seen in children less than 5 is what we are worried about more than 5 we are not so much worried we'll give a vaccine and that's all I, the the worry anyway the tail is gone the the eyelids of langer hands are gone the tail is gone so i not bother about removing spin because I, I also this is something new that spleen can survive on short gastrics is a new phenomenon actually i never I never believed in it but if this girl has chronic pain the shrunken spleen and you know i see those things happen and that would be a terrible thing again there's no medical treatment for that there again you have to go for surgery and try to remove whatever there so i would have, i would have, especially in this situation i would have taken that chance spleen you have preserved a spleen many times uh, even after ligating the splenic artery as a mysore and said short gets gastric sir enough okay so we okay. call it as a wash or technique that is a well defined technique for patients who are having for distal pancreatectomy so what we do is we purposely we we, we take the whole thing but we like it the splenic artery and splenic vein proximal to the transection site and the spleen survives the short gastric that's what it's been described that's why we are very bold enough to you know divide the splenic vessels with a uh, you know hope that uh, the short gastric will completely supply this and uh, i never done any reconstruction and we have done splenectomy for some occasions where we have to even divide the short gastric then there is no other option we have to take it out but the short gastrics are preserved and we tend usually not to take the spleen out now again uh, in this sort of pancreas it is related uh, position we have splenic vein thrombosis i am sure this girl did not have correct sir correct If she didn't have, it's fine. If there is splenic vein thrombosis, the problems are many. Correct, sir. But this patient, I, you know, you might have seen the picture. The splenic vein is completely normal. Mm -hmm. So I was, uh, at one point, I was thinking whether to take the spleen out or not. But it's completely normal. The spleen color is fine. Why unnecessarily taking the spleen out, especially for this young girl? So I just left it like that. That is the main reason. No. Otherwise, All is I would well. The dense well. Yeah. Uh, Chalpati, you have a comment. I think you come in quite late. Yeah, I came quite late. I'm sorry. Uh, 
I'm sure this would have been a very good case uh, and well yeah, managed. Uh, Mahesh, if you don't mind, just show Chalapati the uh, uh, fistulogram. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, sorry for joining late. I got very aggressive endotherapist. Okay, I, I better uh, show him also that. Uh, we we. Uh, this yeah. is the right. You can see the, the left side. This Just is uh, the X-ray which has been the taken when ah, yeah, yeah. Right. took the feeding tube to the, the pancreatic pleural fistula and injected right. the dye. And okay. the dye comes through. This is the proximal duct, and this is the distal duct, and this is the hole struck created by the previous stent. Okay, so you injected it from the uh, ICTD. I, uh, intercostal tube drain, is it so? I didn't get no, you. No, what properly. we did was, see, they, they, they call me from, in from the table that they, they found a defect. In the go, to the, go to the previous picture. So what I asked is, I asked them to put the infant feeding tube through the defect and secure it and that comes through the chest wall. So oh, I injected from the me. Oh, okay. That's quite interesting. But what did the previous yeah. ERCP show? I mean, what did they do? So the previous ERCP showed there is a complete dust duct disruption and uh -huh. there is a cirrhosis. Uh -huh. so they put a stent and uh -huh. which we, you know, uh, as an ERCP, you know, invariably the stent will go into the cirrhosis only, not goes into the duct majority right. of the time. Right. But what it helps, it helps to drain the cirrhosis completely. Right. 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 Okay. But okay. But it's gone. So, uh, okay. so I said the false flag actually, this is a cirrhosis cyst into which the, the the stent has gone. Right. Okay. Yeah. So if if the stent could not bridge the disruption, uh, it depends. So the success rate comes down to 20 to 60 percent. Depends on where we are able to place the stent. Yeah. So sometimes if we are not able to cannula it, just do a pancreatic spinectomy, the success of resolution is only 20 percent. Sometimes if we are not able to bridge the disruption, but enter the pancreatic duct and place a stent somewhere in the pancreatic duct, Without bridging the disruption, the success rate can go up to 60%. But if we are able to bridge the disruption, even if it is complete, disruption sometimes we will be able to cross through and through, and we will be able to put a stent. So then the success rate goes up to 90% also. But obviously, it depends on how chronic is the fistula uh, uh, is like that. But uh, I think this, uh, uh, I think now I understood why this patient required surgery. Okay. This patient, the history is only six to seven weeks on this. Uh, mm. I, I, I think you might uh, can show you the bottom figure. Uh, you know, you can see the ERCP picture. Actually, right. the stem through the proximal. I think you might, you might be able to see the curls. Uh, and right, then right. where the hump is the defect. And then I uh -huh. actually, my personally myself, I, I read the, the guide where into the distal pancreas. It gone a couple of occasions. But when we feed the mm. catheter on top of it, as soon as it hits that area where the defect is, mm. the catheter is a little bit rigid. It goes into the defect. And then the, the guide wire, which has gone into the distal duct, flips into the defect also. Okay. So, did you have can, any... Uh, you know, bridge it. Right. So, did you have any difficulty in uh, actually identifying the fistula tract intraoperatively? Uh, intraoperatively, what I did was I followed the tract from the chest. I, I can feel right. the inner tract from the chest, but it's like uh -huh. a tiny fibrous tract. Right. I can see where exactly it's, it ends. So what right. I did was, I transect the pancreas just proximal to it, so that I won't mm. go into that area. I can have a fresh mm. stitch, rather than mm. going through the inflamed area. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. The so exactly got, got into it. That's why we have to like it this way. All right. And so you uh, excised all the fistula tract. Was it necessary or not? What I did was I um, traced the pancreatic pleural fistula tract and proximally oh. I, you know, pooped it and ligated it proximally and cut and brought the, the portion from the pancreas along with the distal pancreatic fistula. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I'm sure. Very complex surgery. Sorry, I, I made you repeat all these things. I'm sorry. For oh, no, not at all. Not at all. Yeah. This is actually, you know, this is a complex case. You know, we also see, you know, once in a lifetime like that, you know, pancreatic approval is repeated. Right, right. It's fair complication. But we right. actually, you know, it, your input actually helps us, you know, what else that we can do for this patient in case if we get a similar case in future. Um. So, um, 
So one thing is, uh, it all depends on the success of ERCP. Are you able to bridge the disruption or not? That's the only thing. Uh, I think already that is done and uh, the gastroenterologist is not able to cross. So I think uh, next thing would be doing a distal pancreatectomy. So one the, thing that was described in done. the literature was Rendua procedure co with the combination of EUS and ERC. I don't know, I've never you know, right. heard about it. But yeah. uh, is it possible? Yeah, so what we can do is uh, through EUS, we can identify the pancreatic duct and uh, through the stomach we can puncture through the, we can puncture the pancreatic duct uh, upstream the presumed disruption right okay. upstream upstream to the fistulous tract okay so then then what you do is you feed the uh, wire uh, downstream towards the papilla so then uh, what happens is your wire is coming through the mouth and enters the esophagus, the stomach, transgastric into the upstream pancreatic duct okay. because you are punctured through the transgastric. And then if you are successful enough, you are feeding it from above down, that is from upstream to downstream. So then, then that actually completes the you know bridging. So you'll be able to bridge. So now the wire is through and through the entire pancreatic duct, crossing the fistula, downstream duct and coming out of papilla. You understand what I'm saying? Yes, sir, yes, sir. But has right. it been done, sir? Yeah, yeah, it has been done. Yes, yes. It has been done in difficult cases. Now, what we do is uh, uh, in difficult cases of uh, chronic calcific pancreatitis or patients who are, you know, difficult uh, endotherapy patients, uh, if you are not able to cross the pancreatic structure or uh, not able to cannulate the papilla, we do something called pancreatic gastrostomy uh, through EUS or like this rendezvous procedure by EUS. So we do the same thing, puncture the pancreatic duct from the stomach and then uh, enter the, uh, uh, negotiate the wire through the papilla, bring it out of papilla into the second part of duodenum and then exchange the scope, go through ERCP and reverse cannulate it or complete the procedure with same EUS scope by doing a pancreatic gastrostomy. So similar thing is being done for these kind of fistulas. If, you know, uh, to avoid kind of this kind of surgeries, uh, if it is morbid or patient is not fit like that. So, and it all depends how expert the endoscopist is and how uh, good he's at US and all these kind of stuff. Okay. Okay. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Govin, what is your question? Govin? Yeah. Hello, sir. Hello. Hello. Yes. Uh, yes, sir, in this patient, we had actually uh, mentioned that the splenic vein was normal in the imaging and uh, intraoperatively, uh, we did a distal pancreatectomy and came out. So, sir, I'm not able to get you. What did he say? The voice is in breaking. Case there would, uh, the, uh, sir, in this surgery uh, for this patient, uh, prior to surgery, we were sure that the splenic vein was normal. That's what you told, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. The splenic vein, sir. So, in case there would have been some splenic vein thrombosis, would that uh, change our management? Thrombosis, sir. Yes, sir. Thrombosis. Due to chronic calcific pancreatitis or chronic pancreatitis, if there is a splenic vein thrombosis, like in what percentage, uh, uh, what percentage of uh, splenic vein thrombosis due to chronic pancreatitis does a patient present with uh, gastric viruses or such complications? In order to prevent such if the patient already had, yes, prevent, you mentioned yes. something like the patient yes. may develop gastric viruses or the patient already had yes, a gastric sir. viruses or something, then splenectomy is the cure. So we have to yes, ligate the splenic artery in the splenic vein, take the spleen out, that actually completely so uh, you know sorts the gastric viruses which is already there. But <coughs> if 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 the short gastrics are really good, still we can go ahead and do the spleen preserving distal pancreatomy by ligating both splenic artery and the vein. Nothing will happen. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, uh, my question is like uh, for splenic vein thrombosis, uh, anticipating gastric viruses in future and doing a splenectomy is not uh, uh, advisable. If there is, you know, you're talking about left side portal hypertension. Uh, in, in those cases, if there is a left side portal hypertension splenic vein thrombosis, if I'm going to go for a spleen uh, distal pancreatectomy, I always, you know, counsel the patient, I'm going to take the spleen out because if you take the spleen out, the short gastrics will become smaller. And because the splenic vein 
actually uh, if there is a splenic vein thrombosis the blood has to divert through the short gastric so they will form gastric as well as esophageal viruses in those situation if you take the spleen out it's actually a treatment for those viruses okay sir okay okay thank by you by the way this is acute pancreatitis induced pathology not chronic pancreatitis so okay the, sir okay sir and no i was just clearing it out thrombosis yeah. unlikely yeah Yes, yeah, sir. Yes, sir. Any question? Thank you. Online. Yes, thank you. So I think it's a wonderful case and wonderful discussion, Mahesh. Very well done, and, and so much, uh, patient came out well, and I think that's that's the proof is in the pudding. And if any any there no any any further comments? If there are no comments, then uh, about any yeah. Um, any any comment from anyone? So there are no comments, and thank you so much. Thanks for a nice case presentation. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Sir. Thank you. See you again soon.